Thank you, Garrett. So now we completely change gears. We still stay with supercurrents, or what I like to call macroscopic quantum states, but we are not discussing any more easy plane ferromagnets or antiferromagnets, but we now go to the real world, which is the magnets. So let me let <laughs> <laughs> I have to say that looking at Yaroslav. <laughs> anyway, okay. Uh, so magnon supercurrents in a room temperature, magnon uh, condensate. Um, why are we doing this? Let me spend a few words because we need to always to justify to the society why and what we are doing. So the idea is very clear. We have CMOS and we are thinking about potential post-CMOS technologies and there are many reasons behind. Basically, let it make very short because we as a basic field scientist, we always want to have some change of paradigm. The change of paradigm I'm proposing here, actually many people are proposing is go away from a particle-based logic, <coughs> which CMOS is, because in CMOS you have electrons and either you have the electrons in your hand, then it's logically a one, or you don't have the electrons and it's logically a zero, and go to wave-based computing. And that actually has been studied by many people, uh, by, by many communities, and uh, the, the question is simply, if you do wave-based computing, what kind of waves should you use? So, novel paradigm is wave computing, and uh, what I propose here, what many others propose, is simply, if you do that, then use magnons, the quanta of the spin waves, as the wave particles, which you can do. You see here a typical magnon, just uh, in, a, in, a, in a nice animation. What is nice about waves is simply you have an amplitude and you have a phase, so you have two quantities which characterize it, not only just the particle number. So if you do magnon computing, well, why using spin waves and magnons? Well, there are so many advantages on the, on the list. The wavelengths can be very small. We saw it already this morning. Frequency can go up to terahertz, so there's plenty of space for you to do research, <coughs> go away from the current gigahertz range to the terahertz. Interference effects are easily accessible. Mm -hmm. We have very efficient nonlinear effects which you need if you want to do data processing. You need nonlinear effects. Uh, everything can be done at room temperature. There is no dual heating. And actually, our our speaker from this morning, uh, um, Arne Bratas, uh, printed the word or coined the word insulatronics. I think it was you or was it Garrett? <laughs> it was the audience. <laughs> <laughs> get some, get the correct acknowledgement. Um, footprint can be small, you can have an all wave logic, and what is also very, very important, you can have good converters to CMOS. So that is why this field is often called magnon spintronics. And you have heard about magnonics and magnon spintronics. This is actually the same for the, uh, the, the two words for the same thing. In fact, it is not, and I will just discuss it in a few seconds. But let me just say, that on this field a lot of achievements have been made so far. I only would like to, 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 to show here three things which actually happen under the guidance of Andre Schumach in my group. So logic gates have been made, majority gates have been made. Magnon transistor, which is full magnonic, has been created. And many things have been made by other groups. That is a very and very active, a very active field. So back to magnonics and magnon spintronics. <coughs> magnonics, that is a field where you do everything with magnons. And you can build logic gates, data buffering, analog data processing, reconfigurable elements, magnon conduits. But uh, you have to take the interface to the electrons into account, and that is the spin hall effect, inverse spin hall effect, spin transfer, uh, spin talk transfer effects, and so on. Uh, and then this entire field you can call mm -hmm. magnon spintronics or spintronics with magnons. And I was already listening here. Several items which are important. Um, you need the efficient converters in order to go from this field to that field. Material is a very big issue, but no time to discuss it. We make our life for the rest of my talk very simple. We simply discuss only yttrium iron garnet, which is just the best material we have in terms of damping, the best practical material, I should say. And what is also new, and this now leads to the su real subject of my talk, we shall discuss macroscopic magnonic quantum state computing. Uh, before I go into this, let me just make another side remark, because I find it always very interesting, very informative. And that is, despite our scientific magnonics or magnon spintronics community, there exist other communities, for instance, one of architects who build devices, who think about how could a future computer, a wave-based computer, look like. 
and they come up with these kind of designs, what you see here. Here's another very nice design. If you think like a physicist about it, how shall that work, you will find out it will never work because it's just too primitive. You just see here just a few different layers which should indicate some kind of functionality. But if you really think about how shall this work, you will find out it will, it will not work. So there's still a big bridge to make. But this community is very useful for us, again, if we ask for our, so, 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 uh, for our responsibility towards society because it can tell us how good we can do our research. And that is simply by looking into the performance of the devices which we still need to invent. So they discuss already about devices which we haven't invented yet. But, but what they do, they build, for instance, all kind of logic devices using Marknons and these acronyms. I have a list, actually. If you're really interested, I can give you the list. Stand for, for different kind of devices, for adders, half adders, full adders, um, uh, multipliers, and, 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 and so on, uh, dividers. And what is important is they, they calculate the area they need. You cannot read it, but it is not necessary to read it. They calculate the energy you need, the delay time and the power. And then they come up with a number they call the area delay power product, which you find here. And that is the most important number. So it's just this one. That is just the ratio of that what you can do with Marknons compared to what you can do with electrons. And I think this figure here captures the results. What you see here is uh, that if you have hybrid CMOS spin wave device circuits and compare it to 10 nanometer CMOS, which is very, very advanced, then you'll see that uh, here there's a Marknons, which are shown here in green, always perform much better, that is a logarithmic scale here, than, than, than the CMOS. And finally, you come up that the area can be three about uh, three to four times smaller. Delay is slower, but the power consumption can be 100 times lower. So this really tells us that we should continue now with all our Marknonic stuff, and we shall still continue to think about novel approaches, just so much as a side remark. So, okay. Then we are set to develop new directions. I mean, using Marknons, doing interference, building logic gates with some interference patterns. This all has been done. And we were just asking in my group, what can we do beyond? And uh, basically, we looked around and we found that it is all there. It is just existing in other communities. And if you go to superconductivity, or this morning we learned about superfluidity, you find the concepts all there. And the question is simply, how well can it be translated into our magnonics world? Uh, so the main idea is simply just find novel magnon states which are useful for information transfer and processing. And one answer is a macroscopic magnonic quantum state might serve here perfectly for information transfer and uh, processing. Uh, you know very well what might stand here behind. For instance, the most known macroscopic magnonic quantum state is a magnonic Bose-Einstein condensate, which exists now for about uh, 10 years, has been widely studied. And I will give you an introduction how this actually works, because with this we need. And if you have a macroscopic magnonic quantum state, then you can think about transport. And the best example of transport in such a device is just a supercurrent. We have heard about this this morning, but this is now a supercurrent using really Marknons. There are many other things you can do. For instance, you can, again, make a marriage between the Marknons and the phonons. Then you have that, that we, then uh, you can have a very special new states which might propagate actually very, very fast. Alexander Saga will talk about this Magnon phonon states uh, this afternoon, and he will tell you that a lot of new physics uh, is contained if you realize these hybrid states in, 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 in our systems. So, again, I mentioned already our macroscopic magnonic quantum states can be really thought as being analogous to superconductivity and to superfluidity. So we can simply go to these fields and just try to find what kind of ideas we can transfer to our fields. Uh, uh, they are free of dissipation, but um, you have to make a bracket behind. This simply means free of dissipation apart from the residual coupling to, to, to the phonon bars. And uh, this, in the development of the field, was always a big obstacle because people were saying, why are you talking about 
super, supercurrents in your system if the supercurrents only live for a finite lifetime? Isn't it that a supercurrent has to persist forever because otherwise it wouldn't be a supercurrent? Of course, that is a very valid argument, but, 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 but the counter argument we learned from Jaroslav this morning is simply we can subtract or the dissipation channels to the photonic to the phononic system because we can describe with the best accuracy all these processes with a unique damping parameter alpha, which has no wave vector and no frequency dependence, I should say, for those magnons we are discussing here. So we can really separate it away. And uh, actually that is so just yeah. a quick comment. you're pumping your system very yeah. strongly. Right? Yeah. There's a lot of dissipation associated with Yeah, this I will cover. This I will cover. This is all covered. This is all covered. I will show you. Yeah, yeah. That is all covered. Of, of course, you have a lo lot of nonlinearity in the system. But nonlinearity simply means you have magnetic mode coupling. What you do in the, se in the theory, in the theoretical description, and I show that, is simply just an expansion of the processes into one magnon, two magnon, three magnon, four magnon, five magnon, six magnon, and so on processes. And then you make, of course, some approximations. But uh, that is how you, how you cover these, these strong coupling cases. So free of dissipation means apart from the magnon phonon and magnon electron <coughs> coupling. Actually, if you look back in history, if you look back how the discussion of the Bose-Einstein condensates in all the fields of physics where this exists went, it was just the same problem. I mean, if you go to the ultra cold quantum gas community people, their Bose-Einstein condensates also have a finite lifetime because after some time, the atoms hit the walls of the vessel, and so they also have to treat it somewhere. And from them, we learned this trick that you basically are able to prepare the system such that you can separate away these damping mechanisms. And here is just the same thing. So much on the damping and whether it is a, it's a, it's a, it's a persistent current. Uh, to just to tell you the summary of my talk already here, uh, we could not find any indication that these currents are not persistent if you take this damping here away. Uh, so at least there is no counterexample yet. And the most prominent example for such a magnetic uh, macroscopic quantum state is a magnetic Bose-Einstein condensate. So I will spend, especially for the younger people among you, a few minutes to discuss what is going on there. OK, but before I start, I have to mention the people in my group who have done that. There is, in particular, Dima Boschko, who is a PhD student, just writing up his thesis. That is why he's not here. There is Vitaly Vazushka, Alexander Saga, who is here. Actually, here in the front row, yes. And uh, we need a lot of theoretical support here. I mean, it's a typical field of physics which only progresses by combining experiments with, with, with very good theory. And uh, as in particular, I would like to mention here Gennady Malkov from Kiev University and Viktor Wolf and uh, his fiancée, uh, Anna Pomialov from the Weizmann Institute in Israel. And the theory I'm showing is actually done by Viktor Wolf. Introduction, this is a spin wave. If you haven't seen yet one, you might notice you have a wavelength. Notice that spin waves can run in any direction, not only parallel or not only perpendicular to the spins. That is sometimes very important. So uh, what you can do, you can consider the magnons as a quanta of the spin waves, and then they have energy given by the exchange constant, eta here in this case. They have linear momentum, they have mass, they have spin. And what is also nice, they have a lifetime typically of the order of several hundred nanoseconds. <laughs> and uh, that is good because, I mean, you have to compare this number to, for instance, the intrinsic time scales you need to thermalize uh, gas of magnets, for instance. And the good thing is that, that this lifetime is long enough so that we really can observe a system converging towards uh, an equilibrium situation. So it's a very nice scenario. And now the theory, I do not really want to go with you now through all the theory behind the magnum modes. So let me do it just in the following way. What we need to write down in a classic approach is the landau lifshitz torque equation is a torque, time derivative of the magnetization is a torque. Uh, um, and here the right side is just the torque acting on the magnetization um, exerted by an effective field acting on the magnetization. And you have to solve it. 
And what matters is the field which acts on the magnetization. And the field has different contribution, an external field. Then we have the dipole-dipole interaction we were discussing here written down in the Green's function approach. You have to sum up over all the other moments in your system. And since the dipole-dipole interaction is long range, this is very, very costly in terms of numerics. Of course, you play tricks to reduce it. And then there is exchange interactions. The exchange interaction in Laplace squared m basically measures the canting between neighboring moments. And it is clear the shorter the wavelength is, the more dominant the exchange interaction is. And if you do that, and if you calculate everything, mind the dipole-dipole interaction, and you might know the dipole-dipole interaction is very, very unisotropic. I mean, if you play on the, on, your, on, on, on the kitchen refrigerator with the magnets, then you know it matters a lot whether you hold the magnets like that or like that or even like that with 90 degree. So the dipole-dipole interaction is very unisotropic. And you see it immediately if you look into the dispersion. What you see here, for instance, in, in, in pink, is a dispersion where the wave vector is perpendicular to a field. All these quantities here are in plane for a film. Or whether the propagation is parallel to the field where we have this blue dispersion curves. And we can have anything here in between, just rotating the wave vector between the perpendicular and the parallel geometry. So all the states here in between are filled. And you also might notice this here is actually the surface mode, sometimes called the surface mode, Daman Eschbaum mode. This is called the backward volume mode, frequency against wave vector. You see the negative slope, which gives this mode the name because the group velocity is negative, and therefore the mode runs backward. You see also for a finite film thickness here all the standing waves here in between, where the waves have some component which lets the wave propagate between the two, two surfaces of the film. And so basically what we have is in a large area where we have different, many, many different modes, and which we then can, of course, firmly populate. Uh, you might notice for large wave vectors, uh, the, the, the increase, which, which turns over into a quadratic dependence, that is due to the exchange interaction. And here's this area shown here in pink, that is the area where the dipole-dipole interaction dominates. And of course, there's a gradual transition, not a sharp transition, between these two regimes. So that is basically our most fundamental item we need to know, the dispersion of the spin waves in a, sin or in, in, in a magnetic film. Material is ertium iron garnet. It's not, it's not thin, it's a couple of micrometer thick. So now the next issue is regards the frequency scale is gigahertz. So if we do experiments at room temperature, you all know that the thermal population of all these modes is just the same. Um, nonlinear processes, so linear and nonlinear processes, what do we have? We have a couple of different processes. The first one is uh, two Mark non scattering, which is linear. That is simply, you have some distortion in your material, a void or dislocation or whatever it is. And then what can happen is that a Mark non with energy epsilon 1 and momentum P1 is just arriving and then it is scattered away. It can change direction, but it cannot change frequency because of the time invariance of this, of this problem. So that is two Mark non scattering, sometimes very disturbing. What can we do against it? Well, we can use a very clean material with no dislocation, no voids, and so on. And that is why we love to use yttrium iron garnet, because it is really a perfect single crystal material to the best, best, best perfection you can, you, you can get in a real system. Next processes, after two Mark non scattering, we have uh, the nonlinear processes. We have three Mark non scattering processes. So we have two of them. One Mark non can just decay into two other Mark nons, or two Mark nons can show a confluence into one single Mark non. Again, energy and momentum has to be conserved. So typically, this green Mark non decays into two blue Mark nons of half the frequency. I mean, the rule is only that the sum has to be the same, but this is the most likely process. Um, so we have two different frequencies uh, uh, divided by a factor of two in our system if you have three Mark non scattering. And then we can continue four Mark non scattering, and the dominant four Mark non scattering process is simply that two incoming Mark nons scatter and two Mark nons with different energies and different momenta go out. And if you now look very, very carefully, this process is particle conserving, yeah, because you have two incoming particles and two outgoing particles. And what we now can do is uh, we can use very clean yik. So the two Mark non scattering is just going out. 
and uh, then uh, we can go back to the dispersion curves. And you know, if you have three Markov scattering processes, in order to have them effective, you have to have density of states in the initial Markov states and in the final Markov states. And you have seen the dispersion curves before. You saw there was a minimum frequency and so on. You can really create scenarios where you do not have at the same time the needed initial and final states available, and therefore this process can be suppressed. So we get rid of the two Markov scattering. We get rid of the three Markov scattering processes. And then all we are left with is just the four Markov scattering. And four Markov scattering is particle conserving. And this simply means it is very reminiscent of what you know from, from your, f your first year of physics if you discuss the classic gas. I mean, kinetic gas theory simply works. You have two gas molecules, and they scatter, and they exchange energy and momentum. But the total energy, the total momentum, and the number of par total number of particles stays constant. So we can apply kinetic gas theory here. And that is why we, why we coined the, the term Mark non-gas for what we are now discussing soon. So what will happen? Um, this is an open system, so therefore the chemical potential is zero. And this simply means that if you look into the Bose-Einstein distribution function, and this is gigahertz frequency scale, if you compare it to the, to the terahertz scales of room temperature um, energies, then uh, all these states are equally populated. What we would like to see. Yeah, okay. sure, please. Um, how did the three magnons go? I missed that. Is that just energies? Yeah, I mean, see, I mean, if you if you see the scale, uh, you see a five gigahertz. Yeah, so I mean, this is not plotted to zero. I mean, if you want to have three magnons, this goes from five to about seven point five gigahertz. So uh, you need to have a frequency difference of a factor of two. Yeah, if you move, what you can do, you can move this entire spectrum up and down simply by changing the applied fields, Lamo, Lamo precession frequency arguments. Yeah. If, you, if you work at much lower fields, then you would have three Markov processes. Okay. And, uh, and what about uh, uh, processes where um, three magnons uh, turn into one? That, that would be a four Markov scattering process. Magnons. That exists, but it, the, the, the probability is very, very, very small. They're, they're weak. But yeah, they're it's very weak. Is there a reason why it is very weak? But, but again, no, sorry, this would again be forbidden, because then you have to distribute the, the energy of one Markov into three others. Yeah. And the most likely process is always where, where these three have the same. OK, so that's sense. the reason. So the amplitudes of those processes are comparable, do you think? Sorry, the, the, you know, the scattering and the matrix so elements of those probably, processes. Probably. Okay. So we have this situation, and of course now what we would like to do, we would like to have Bose-Einstein condensation. And Bose-Einstein condensation is simply that we collect all the magnons at the lowest point in energy, which you find actually here. And you see the minimum here is actually at finite wave vectors. So it's not at zero wave vector. So how can we bring all the magnons down to here? That is, of course, a big problem. But what we can do is we can switch this open system where all the magnets are thoroughly excited into a closed system. And that is simply by bringing it out of equilibrium. We bring it into a new equilibrium, which is a flow equilibrium, which is far away from the thermal equilibrium. And that is simply by now injecting magnets into the system. And the way we do it is very, very simple. What we do is we throw microwave photons at this frequency into the system. And a microwave photon will decay into two magnons of half the photon frequency. You see this here. Yeah. And since the microwave photon has, on this scale, zero wave vector, these two magnons have to have opposite wave vectors. So we create a pair of magnons here and there. The pair of magnons could also be created here and there, and there, and there, and so on, if there is sufficient density, density of, of states in, 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 in the magnon dispersion. So, the nice thing is we inject magnons via this parametric pumping at this position. And then, of course, we have a non-equilibrium situation. And in fact, the process of injecting magnons uh, is very efficient. So we can really large, uh, inject large quantities of magnons into the system. <laughs> if that happens, <coughs> the number of particles, it's not, it's not an open system anymore. And this means that the chemical potential now deviates uh, from zero. And uh, as a result, 
as a result, um, if you look into the Bose Einstein distribution function, here you see the chemical potential, uh, then as a result, uh, this, 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 this denominator here becomes, uh, will change, will change uh, the size. What will actually happen is the following. These Mark knots, which are here, they now undergo four particle scattering. Yeah, so these particles can scatter into some other states. And this is very, very schematically shown here with the arrows. And very quickly, this population here will just change over into a population of all these states here below. And via this process, the magnons lose their phase. So it's an incoherent gas of magnons, which you now find here in this area. And then finally, due to the four magnons scattering, if everything works right, then they will condense here into the Bose-Einstein condensation. So that is basically the recipe behind. Uh, before I continue with that, let me tell you how we measure that. We have the method of Brillo on light scattering, which turns out to be extremely versatile for studying these phenomena. Idea is very simple. We use oh sorry, we use photons from a laser. Um, single frequency monochromatic photons, and they are scattered by the magnons. And in second quantization language, either a magnon is created or annihilated, and the scattered photon carries away that information. So by measuring the scattered photons, we know the frequency and the wave vector of the magnon. Frequency you see in a spectrum, so we use we need to have some 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 spectrometer behind. Then we see the frequency of the magnon as a frequency shift here of the elastically scattered light from the laser. And the intensity tells us something about the population of these magnon states. And uh, this works very well. So typical setup you see here. Here is a sample, actually with the YIC film face down. Here you see in the front row, you can see it in yellow, just a microstrip, uh, which we use uh, to excite, the, to, to, to bring the microwave photons uh, into the sample. The microwave photons are generated with a microwave uh, source, and, and then as a switch to have pulsed, pulsed microwaves. We use an amplifier here in between. We use a Fabi Perot interferometer here, very schematically, to, to detect the frequency shift. And uh, what we also can do, since this is an optic technique, we can scan with a laser focus across the sample, so we have spatial resolution with the resolution you can have in an optical setup. And uh, since we also use pumped, we use, we use pulsed microwaves, we can measure the time delay between generation and detection. And so we get temporal information in addition, which is very, very useful. And what is nice is we, can, we have the laser beam here. Here is a sample again. Here's the microwave pumping here. A microwave cavity is actually used, but this is only a detail. We can change the angle of incidence, and by that we can vary the wave vector. And with quite some precision, we can measure this way as a wave vector of the magnet. So it's all accessible. I'll show you one example. For instance, that is the dispersion dia diagram you have just seen be before. I only have rotated it by 90 degrees. So this is now the wave vector scale, and that is a frequency scale. You know, just to be familiar for you. So for instance, what we can do, we can measure at the frequency of the Bose-Einstein condensate as a function of time, so you see as a time. And then we measure for this given frequency the wave vector distribution, which we can easily extract from our data. And here is a wave vector scale. So that is why I rotated here this diagram from before. So it's just this diagram here now rotated by 90 degrees. Um, and then we get here the distribution, and then we have access to the formation of the gas and maybe the Bose-Einstein condensate. And in this experiment, which was done actually with a small pumping power, we see we need the pumping piles is between here and about there. And then you see there are some initial dynamics, and this I will skip for my talk because this is just the dynamics of, of the different scattering processes. We understand it quite well, but not not important for the talk. Then you see how the magnon gas here is finally populated. And then after some time later, out of the magnon gas, the condensate is forming. Yeah. And what I need to tell you, the line bits, what we find here for the condensate and on the wave vector scale is experimental resolution. So obviously, to the best we can say from the experiment, that is uh, a, co a, coherent, a coherent state. Yeah. Is it integrated over some energy range? That is, yeah, that is uh, an integrated over a very small energy range across uh, Bose-Einstein condensate uh, frequency. Yeah. 
not over the entire range, on, only here. I show this a little bit more. But in, in the energy range corresponds to why the momentum range? Because the dispersion. No, we, 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 we integrate over a very small energy range, all the photons which are scattered from this energy frequency shift. Yeah. So you're just looking at that point, essentially? In no, the we look at the function of the wave vector. Yeah. And right. we find the condensate just here. Yeah. And that is actually a strong argument, because if you look here in the dispersion curve, you see the dispersion curve is very flat. Yeah? And if you would like to identify both the Einstein condensate by a, via uh, the, 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 the delta uh, peak on, on the frequency scale, um, given the experimental resolution we have, this would be a weak argument, because the curve is here so flat. Yeah? But if we measure it now in wave vector space, and you see on the wave vectors, it is very narrow here. Yeah? It's just the My experimental is resolution. The energy range does correspond to a broad momentum range. Yeah, yeah. The energy so range is really is only is only this one. Right. Yeah, that is the energy range. It's so only this narrow peak. Yeah. Okay, I, sh I show, I show it in a uh, second. Uh, a and continuum of modes. Which yes, are yes, yes, out. yes. And okay. the wave vector is resolved in the spectrum. So this is very nice to monitor now the development of both Einstein condensates and then to see the temporal temporal behavior. If we, for instance, pump with a much larger power, then something very different happens. You see, uh, now the, the gaseous state extends to much higher, to much higher frequencies, yeah, yeah, to much higher wave vectors. So we have now, sorry, to much higher wave vectors. So we have many states now in this regime which are now populated yeah, because of the stronger pumping. Uh, but you see, no bose einstein condensate is formed while we are pumping because the system is driven too much out of equilibrium. But now, just from the experiment, if we switch off the pumping here, then you see all the magnons, which, which are just here, yeah, all these magnons, they condense again into the Bose-Einstein condensate, which is formed here. Yeah. So we populate everything, uh, but only if we switch off the pumping, all these states just condense into this one, and then finally the intensity goes up. That's it. Initially, this we, we, we considered it very counterintuitive, but if you think about it, that these are all in this regime flow equilibrium states, then it is, uh, uh, I think, not so difficult to understand. Yeah. Okay. Excuse me. That, that probably requires some coupling to the environment for the magnets to lose the energy. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Of course. It's always a residual coupling to the phonons. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, this process is very well understood. I have no time again. Sorry to to show that. Uh, we call it a super cooling effect. And it is the same effect like you have if you have your coffee cup and you wonder why your coffee gets cold. Your coffee gets cold because uh, your, your water molecules can evaporate into the space and therefore the, 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 the average uh, time kinetic energy is just reduced. Here the system is very similar. If you if I just go back to, to, to this view graph you have seen it before. You have four Magnon scattering processes where one Magnon just goes up anywhere here. Yeah? And this means the total energy in that area is just reduced. And that is what we call the evaporation effect. And you can write it down with rate equation. We have done that. That is a, that, that, that is, um, uh, a theory done by Andrei Slavin and Tivakevich, uh, uh, Vasil Tivakevich. And they have worked it out. And it fits perfectly on all our, on all, all our data. So that is by at the added all trickles down. Yeah, and originally, it is clear if you have two states here, then one has to go up and one has to go down. And uh, of course, you lose magnons, but if you have enough, you still have enough for the condensation. It is also clear that for a finite temperature, uh, you need a minimum number of magnons in this state in order to form a condensate, which is just given by the by the difference by the, by the ratio between uh, the, the temperature at which we measure, which is 300 Kelvin, and the energy here of the state. We can calculate the minimum number of magnons you know from that theory. Do about uh, the processes that turn magnons into phonons? That is basically the parameter alpha, um, the damping parameter alpha. alpha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nothing um, else. It's a rate. I show you, wait a, wait a few seconds, I show you the a rate equation model, and it has exactly these details in it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I thought I have a lot of time with this 50 minutes, but I'm noticing I'm losing time. 
but maybe it's good just to go through the details. So here now you see the full glory of, of Brillo on light scattering because you see the spectra again. This is the same figure you have seen before. And now we do an experiment with very narrow frequency bands, but three different frequencies. The frequency of the injection of the magnons, we pick out a frequency out of the, the, the gaseous states, and then we do the same here for, for the, for the Bose-Einstein states. And if we do so, you see here in pink the area, the temporal area over which we do the pumping. This is the time scale, and the vertical scale is just the intensity, what we measure here with BLS. So if we do the pumping, we always have some initial dynamics, and I'm not going to discuss that. And you see that if we switch off the pumping, this states here are very quickly depopulated, because these states just scatter into the other states. And if we look into the gaseous phase, so this blue here, then we see this, they live already for some longer time, but still there is a rather fast fall off. And if we now look here into the Bose-Einstein states, we see in this case we get some intermediate state here. So there is a flow equilibrium of Bose-Einstein. Obviously I have to say for a given pumping rate. But if we switch it off, then you see that now all this gaseous magnons condense into this state, and therefore we observe the characteristic uprise here of the, of the intensity, and this means the number of magnons here in these states. And then finally, of course, it decays. Uh, in this case, with 400 nanoseconds, which for that sample is the intrinsic decay time. So that is alpha here, because there is no other states it can decay into. So the decrease of the density of the paramagnetic magnons at the gaseous magnon phase results in a sharp increase of the intensity of the pump-free Bose-Einstein magnon condensate. Okay. Now, what we want to know, so that is Bose-Einstein condensate. Wait a few seconds and I will also show the model, but I would just like to combine it now with the, with the subject of my talk. And these are the supercurrents. Um, paramagnetically injected magnons uh, what we do is we sense, of course, the magnon density by using laser spectroscopy. Laser spectroscopy is on the system where the, where the condensate exists. We focus with the laser light, we collect the inelastically scattered photons. So the question is simply, does it influence the condensate? Of course, no, because why should the photons change, uh, change the condensate? I mean, they are not creating in a decent number of the magnons, the inelastic light scattering, the change in the population to the inelastic light scattering is really negligibly small. So this cannot play a role. And indeed, if we do experiments for the pumping gas, this is, this is the Brillo and light scattering for the parametrically injected magnons, you see there is no difference here depending on the laser power we use for detecting these magnons. Yeah, it's, all, it's all more or less the same, especially the decay here is identical for the different laser powers, which runs actually from 0.8 milliwatt to over 100 milliwatt, so more than a factor of 100. However, if we do the same for the Bose-Einstein condensate, we see something very surprising, which we cannot understand in terms of what I explained before, because now, depending on the laser power we use for the detection of the Bose-Einstein condensate, we see a strong dependence now here of the signal. On the, on the laser power. So obviously, the laser must somehow modify the system. Of course, if you find that you do a lot of experiments just to systematically investigate that, that is now a lesson to the experimentalists among you, not really for the theoreticians. Uh, so for instance, uh, what we can do is uh, we can apply a uniform temperature to the system simply by air, air heating, and if we do so, you really, we really find that depending on the temperature, the data looks pretty much the same. There is a small change here because the saturation magnetization is temperature dependent, and that we see, but essentially the physics, the dynamics, is not changed. Notice this is the same data you have seen before, but here the Brillo and light scattering intensity is on a logarithmic scale. So the decay on the log logarithmic scale now shows up as a linear slope. That is very nice because then you can easily tell whether it's logarithmic or uh, it's, it's exponential or whether you have two exponentials in the system and so on. So this does not change. I can skip this part. Uh, so now the next point is simply what happens if we now um, focus with our laser onto the system, and if we do so, and we always like to use as much laser power as possible because this gives us a much better signal-to-noise ratio, of course what we do, we locally heat the system. 
So we create a temperature gradient in the system. Normally, in Brillouin and light circuit ring, we try to avoid it. But here, we now take advantage out of that. So we, we, we changed the, the, the experimental setup to vary the power. And this we do by just having, so this is a pump pulse for the microwaves. And now we change the duration by which we apply the laser light for the spectroscopy. So we can change the length in time of this pulse. We can also change the amplitude just by changing the laser power itself. And if we do so, then we observe something very, very interesting. That is actually a, 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 a thermograph. So you see really here the laser focus in the middle. Uh, and if we do so, what we observe is that the slope here really changes. And if you look more closely, you will see there's a big change in the initial slope as a function here of the laser pulse power, the total laser pulse intensity we deposit on the sample. But you see there is no change here um, if you just wait a little bit longer, where the Brillouin light scattering intensity is already farther reduced. So it's a very pronounced effect. And uh, what we need to know here, or what we really can guess, here in that area, we have the Bose-Einstein condensate formation. Just remember, we start from this constant flow equilibrium value, then it shoots up where the real condensate is formed. And then after some time, due to the residual coupling to the lattice, it's a population decays. And therefore, the, after some time, the condensate falls below a critical number of particles being in the condensate. And this means the condensate dissolves and just turns over into an ordinary Mark non gas. And this happens about here at this, uh, at this value. So what we have here is only the residual Mark nons in the Mark non gas, no condensate anymore, and this is the condensate. And then you see immediately, if you know that, that already the change in slope is very strong in the condensate, and it disappears if we have uh, only a Mark non gas left over. So how can we understand this? Or oh, just for reference, if we do the same here for the parametrically excited magnets, it's a much higher frequencies. That was at half the pumping frequency. There's no change here as a function of the laser power which we use in the experiment, as it actually should be if we are not disturbing, if we have a non-destructive testing method. So no influence of the thermal gradient. Well, now let me just present the model. And I jump now immediately into the, into the, into the theory. What we assume is that is our laser. And the laser light is focused down to a very small laser focus. We generate the Bose-Einstein condensate that is roughly, very schematically, just this size. It is not circular, but this doesn't really matter. And that is just created where the microwave pumping stripe is here underneath the sample. And what is important is the Bose-Einstein condensate, by definition, is coherent. Yeah. We have a phase transition from an incoherent gas of magnons into a coherent condensate. And a macroscopic quantum state is characterized by a unique wave function with, uh, with the phase of the wave vector as the order parameter. So we don't know what the phase is, but we know the phase is just uh, well defined everywhere across, across uh, this, this, this condensate, this macroscopic quantum state. And now we are just heating the system here in the middle. So the very simple-minded model for that is maybe oversimplified. It's simply that we assume we have the condensate here in blue and in red in the middle, where the red part is, we heat up the system to a, to a temperature T1, and outside is the temperature T2. And you now know, I mean, if you have different temperatures, the saturation magnetization is different, and therefore the Lamour precession frequency is different. And if you continue to think it through, the Bose-Einstein condensate frequency is different. So we have two condensates, one in the middle and one in the blue area with different uh, frequencies, but they are strongly coupled. They jointly form the macroscopic quantum state, and this simply means they can only have one unique common frequency. And this simply means the red area is a little bit out of tune, and this translates into a phase shift. So we have different phases in the condensate in the red part and in the blue part. So we have a phase gradient in the system. And a phase gradient in a coherent system simply means we have a supercurrent. It's the definition of a supercurrent. Not superfluidity, but a supercurrent. So again, this is the arguments. So the phase gradient leads to the formation of a magnetic supercurrent. And the question is, how does it show up? And now we have to go into the mass. And this has been done by Viktor Lvov. And he has written down 
the rate equations, so the theoreticians among you might just quickly work walk through all these equations. Let me take a shortcut by just showing schematically what is happening here. We start. Can I just ask a sure, please. Um, so it's clear that you have currents from the inner to the outer, but how do you know they're supercurrents? There are other kinds of currents. There are other kinds of currents too. Let me show you. Let me show. You. There was a simple motivation for the for the more detailed discussion, which is now. It is not, not, not to follow. Yeah, the actual, there's another kind of current I will introduce in a second, in addition to a supercurrent. So what's the temperature at the center of the plane? It's only a couple of degrees, two, three degrees more than outside. How big, what, this is done at room uh, everything is done at room temperature. Yeah. The laser spot is a couple of... 20 hmm? micrometers. 20 micrometers. So yeah, but absorption is low because it's yik and we work with green light and so. so I mean, we, we did COMSOL simulations just to calculate it. It fits. It all fits. So let me walk you through these equations. Basically, we start with the pumped magnons, with the parametric pumping process, very schematically shown here. So we start with an initial population, which is NP, just here at this given uh, frequency. Then this state will decay into the gaseous states. So here are the gaseous states indicated with NG. And this will simply happen, we describe it with a simple decay model, which works well enough for that, just to, to model that. Um, then we consider the transition of the gaseous states to some intermediate range near the Bose Einstein condensate. And this is described simply by four Mark non scattering. For the theoreticians among you, you find here the corresponding term. It always goes with uh, Gaussian state density to the power of three multiplied with some transition coefficient a gas to, 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 to b. B means simply bottom states here. And we always have the, 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 the coupling to the phonon bars, which, which, which you see here. Then uh, after we have done now the transition from the Gaussian states to this, those close to the bottom here of the spin wave spectrum. Finally, we have to do, this is all incoherent, we have to do the step of the condensation into, in, in, into the, the, the Bose-Einstein condensate, which you find here. So NC is a condensate, and this transition is again modeled here with, with a term which now has both the density of the bottom states and also the density um, of the Bose-Einstein condensate written down here. Actually, it's not really the density of the Bose-Einstein condensate, but a critical density, NCR. And that is exactly the number of magnons you need to have in that state at minimum in order to, to, to form a Bose-Einstein condensate. And that is needed because we are working at room temperature. At zero temperature, this, term, this, 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 this number of magnons would, would, would be zero. And the trick is now simply that we can fit the data with that. We have uh, basically four parameters in it. These are the three coupling constants to the phonon bars, which is gamma G for the Gaussian states, gamma B for the, for the bottom states, and gamma C for the condensate. And uh, we can fit all the data by just assuming the same parameter for them. And that is the argument from this morning that all the states just couple identically to the, to the, to the, to the phonon to the phonons, uh, this means uh, so the, the, the decay time is the same. And then the only parameter we have in this model is just the critical number of states you need to have the formation of the Bose-Einstein condensate. Um, so that is just the mass. And if you have that, you can describe the Bose-Einstein condensation. And now we have, in addition, the gradient of the system. And uh, if you have a gradient in the phase, we have a supercurrent, here you see the relation. So we have to add uh, to, to, to the condensate uh, another term which describes the outflow of Mark nons due to the supercurrent. Mind, Jaroslav, if you might help me, if this is a condensate, yeah, square in this time, and if this is, is just the laser focus, so we heat only in the middle and we measure only in the middle. So if now out of the laser focus the Mark nons flow out, but still within the condensate, we use, we reduce the number of magnons in the laser focus, and we have to describe this process, and this is described here via this term. So we have an additional degree of the population of the condensed magnons due to the magnon supercurrent. 
If we work it out completely, uh, of course, we have to look more critically into, into the phase gradient. We can have, because it's a two-dimensional system, that is a two-dimensional sheet, so we can have currents in this direction and that direction. But fortunately, nature helps us, and uh, uh, we, uh, what, what is found uh, that uh, one term just wins, wins over the other. Uh, what matters here, too, is the, the dispersion coefficients, which describe here these currents, and uh, so they are very different. So we have not only the gx term and the gy term, but, but we can just uh, look it up and we find that, that the, the, the dispersion coefficients in x direction is much larger, actually in this concrete example, 21 times larger than in the y direction, so we can neglect uh, 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 the, 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 the y currents. If we do everything right, so we have the supercurrent, so we, have, we can consider the system as a one-dimensional system. Actually, if you look at it, you have seen that the condensate is at finite wave vectors, but this is a one-dimensional problem, because if you look into the two-dimensional wave vector space, yeah, only here and there, the condensate happens only in two spots in the system, yeah, at plus minus q, for the backward volume modes only. Not, it's not a ring or there are no other directions. Um, if you do the problem very, very carefully, you will find that there is another current contribution, which is called a one-dimensional dispersive supercurrent. That simply has to do uh, that, that we have dispersion here in the system, and if you work it out, you find an additional term. Formally, this looks like a diffusive part, but D is not a diffusion coefficient, it's simply just a dispersion coefficient, and uh, this counteracts uh, the uh, supercurrent you have seen before, um, so you have to take both into account. So simply to do with, with the dispersion, so the curvature and the dispersion. So if you take everything into account, then we find the total supercurrent is just a term just given here by the phase difference, the phase gradient, um, plus a dispersive term uh, which uh, depends on the difference between the actual number of magnons in the condensate minus the minimum number of magnons, uh, and uh, this uh, flows into the opposite direction. And now what you can do, you can use this model to fit the data, and this is the result, and you see how nicely it fits together, and there are only two parameters entering the problem, two fit parameters entering the problem. One is the damping, so the alpha parameter, which we can measure actually independently, or actually which you have by the slope here in, in, the, in, the, in the gaseous regime. And the other is the number of the critical density of magnons you need to achieve the bose einstein condensation. And this very nice agreement we find here lets us believe that indeed we have here evidence for a magnonic uh, supercurrent. There's no other way, to, at least to my knowledge, there's no other way to describe these uh, phenomena. So this was for a maximum temperature, I think this was mentioned just before by, by Alexander, uh, of 4.7 Kelvin, which, we, which of course we can, we can infer from this data. Uh, if we actually do the same thing with a ComSol simulation using a 3D heat transfer model, we find 5.7 Kelvin that is pretty close to that, what we have uh, experimentally. So putting everything together, so the observed dynamics of a room temperature magnon condensate in a ferromagnetic film subject to a thermal gradient can be well understood both quantitatively and qualitatively if we take these magnon supercurrents into account. And of course, we are at the moment doing a lot of new experiments going new directions. Experimentally, that is somewhat demanding because we need little things like a high power microwave generator which just arrived. We had one before which died, so we had to buy a new one. And uh, the geometry is, is, is a little bit different. And we are currently also separating uh, the two, uh, for two laser focuses, so they can use one laser focus for heating and the other for detection only, so we get a spatial image of the condensate. So that is now going uh, on, but it all takes time to, to, to uh, set up in a, in a very well, serious way. Can I just clarify yeah, how you're sure. uh, introducing the magnon uh, supercurrents in your equations? Like, you, know, you, you have this sketch when you have the internal region with one temperature, outside region, yeah. Uh, the the mag fields are slightly different, so the frequencies yeah. of precession yeah. are different that build up the phase. Yeah. Is, is, is that how? Uh, yeah, the Th that is here. In, in, the in the equation, we use a gradual transition, of course. It's not not oh. two sharply separated regions. That was oh, so only. Actually solving yeah, yeah. 
with some gradual yeah. transition. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then uh, you have some additional equation for how phi develops. Okay, so that's delta omega c. Yeah. C. yeah. Yeah, yeah. We get it from we get that all from the console. Uh, where was it from the <coughs> console simulation? So we know the temperature distribution, and then we can calculate. We know how the saturation magnetization varies with the local temperature, and then we and can put it all into one. Just a, a naive question: you, you, You're breaking down the your, uh, thermal mag or excited magnons, magnon, uh, into NG and NB groups. Yeah. So there's some kind of gases. Yeah. Ensemble uh, and the bottom. Yeah, the of, of course. This, this, this like I mean one would not be enough, or like why did you do that? Oh, this has only only technical reasons. Oh, where is it actually? The, the technical reason is simply that. Let me go to this picture. Now, where was it? Yeah, the, techni the technical reason is simply that we can use the magnon gas approach up to very, very close to the condensate. But, but the final step. Then, of course, the I mean, in order to describe the condensation process, the critical number of magnons plays a role, and that is captured by, by this term here. That is captured by this term. But you know, you could try a simpler. I mean, it's still just a very crude model, right? Because maybe you have you need ten groups of magnons or whatever. Did you try to do it with just one? So you have a condensate, and you have some kind of. Yes, yeah, wow. the, the problem the problem is the condensation only happens from the last from the last magnon state in the last oh, four magnon scattering. Sounds a bit vague somehow. Do you have it? I mean, it, it is not it is not vague. I mean, <laughs> here here, here you, bit, al 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 along this path where you have the multiple four magnon scattering events which trickles down the magnons, only the last step yeah goes into the condensate, and only for the last step. The density of the, the number of magnons in the condensate uh, uh, defines the probability by which that step should happen. And this is captured just ah, with this assumption that we consider just an area very close to the condensate that is only defined by, by, by the fact that from those so what's states. The, what's the definition of very close? That, 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 from that from there you need only one step to go into the condensate. The it's a final four magnon scattering, but this depends now on the number of magnons in the condensate. And not only on the number of magnons. But do you have some energy scale in your problem that defines the very close it's Like that depends on the parameters of yeah. the LG? Yeah. Okay. Exactly what you want to Yeah, yeah. I want to comment as uh, experimentalist who has done this. He is necessarily taking into account the peculiarities of our experiment. We have, as Burkhardt demonstrated previously, uh, finite frequency resolution its energy resolution and finite wave vector resolution. And that is why we are not able to prove uh, Bose-Einstein condensate itself. We always detect Bose-Einstein condensate and residuous and uh, incoherent magnet states around. That is why there is two reasons. The first, it's we can operate with this, with this area when area it is the last step in the scattering. But even more important is that we all must take it into account because we detect simultaneously Bose-Einstein condensate plus incoherent states. And we never observe Bose-Einstein condensate itself. It's, 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 it's reminiscent of what you know from, from superfluidity, where you always have a superfluid fluid phase and a, and, a, and a normal phase. Here we always have gaseous magnons plus the superimposed uh, condensed okay. magnons. We're getting uh, yeah. time for some more questions to the speakers. I just want to, want to make the conclusion, but I can just bring it up and uh, it's all there. Yes. And then we can give, uh, use the last minute for discussions. Yes. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Questions, please. Well, let me start. Uh, what do you think about Lucetium uh, Well, could work. Uh, the question is, uh, I mean, of course, we, we try to use, we like, we love to use the material with the lowest damping. Yes. And if you put in Lucetium, then of course you have that's more damping in the system. Yeah. No, no, they say that uh, Cornell says it's lower damping. It's lower, then we need to try. Yeah, <laughs> we need yeah. to try. Mm. More questions? Yes. Uh, so, have you tried to pump the condensate? So, once you create the Bose-Einstein condensate, and then you know you can tune its effective damping also by external yeah. parametric pumping. We have not tried yet. Of course, you you can then use direct parametric pumping to, to see what happens with the dynamics. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's an interesting. 
is a very interesting experiment because you know this parametric pumping is phase uh, sensitive. So we can use, we can uh, measure the phase of the condensation. It's very good, very clever. Mm -hmm. It's a robot. Mm -hmm. Focus. Mm -hmm. Come on, don't be shy. <laughs> Yes. So let me come back to the uh, damping mm -hmm. uh, into the phonon. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, uh, do you, do let's say in bulk E, uh, is it known exactly what phonons is a single uh, uh, magnon to phonon conversion process that dominates this? Yeah. And for these, for these magnets, yeah. For these magnons, okay. So it's very long, very soft, very long wavelength phonons. Yep. Yep. Um, and you would think, you know, the phonon density of states at low energies is not constant. So does that mean that the, you know, and whereas the Gilbert damping, normally the damping is assumed to be proportional to frequency. This is, is it really? Yes, it's this, it's this. Is, is, I mean, it's a standard Gilbert damping mechanism which is used here, which doesn't tell you anything about the physics of the process behind. You simply assume that the population of a given Magnon state, if there wouldn't be any other scattering processes, would decay exponentially and the energy must go, of course, into the phonon system somehow. Must, must, heat, must heat the sample. Okay, I guess a experimental question then. So is it established that the uh, damping is uh, linear in frequency over a broad range of frequencies? But that is well, well studied. Uh, how much is the resonance frequency changed by the factor of two or? Uh, so I think this has been, no, 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 much, much, much larger range. Okay. Yeah. Do you know that's sort of a plant? I mean, and I just know that, that for, for the gigahertz up to, up to a terahertz or so, the, there is no de frequency dependence of alpha okay. in, the, in the picture of Gilbert damping. Mm -hmm. yeah. Principally, yeah. it exists. That is well studied. It exists, mm -hmm. and there is yeah. its, but uh, it depends. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, problem, the problem is more that, I mean, what you don't have so well under control is of two magnon scattering. Of course, with ferromagnetic resonance, with frequency dependent <coughs> measurements, you can, you can separate this. And, uh, of course, what we have here is a, is a uniform thing. And Andres Slavin always says there is no Gilbert damping in Yi. But I never understand no. why he no, says no, no, that. No, no, no. He means, he means. <laughs> Alexander wants to answer. Yeah. <laughs> the Gilbert damping is only phenomenological parameter. It's not really the damping. It's viscosity damping, which is included in landau lifshitz equation. That is why it is possible to do if you only have one relaxation channel. For example, in ferromagnets, you have electron magnon interaction. And in such case, you can use only one damping parameter. If you have different reasons for damping, it means that you should not operate only with one constant damping, with alpha parameter. You should include alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3, and alpha such. And they can depend on frequency, they depend on K number. It may be the interaction with ions in yttrium ion garnet with different valence. It can be interaction with phonons. It can be uh, in the scattering of magnons itself. And that is why it should be included many alpha parameters. Many Gilbert coefficients there. In reality. In only in that region of spectrum, when you can operate with one dominant relaxation channel, in such case you can use the one Gilbert parameter. But only uh, how large frequency? In this, right. in this area, possible. If you will go to higher, uh, to higher frequencies, as good, for example, terahertz frequencies, it's necessary, for example, to take into account the Chirinkov-like interaction. Oh, so, what, what is the frequency range in your case? Is it a factor of two? No, no, no. It's oh, maybe you can, ten, ten two you can go to I would say to to say. Uh, Peter Kopitz calculated these interactions with phonons and magnons in the wide frequency range. It's more complicated dependence. But usually, it's also dependent on K. It is dependent on K. Yeah. But it's dependent on K such you increase energy, K number also increases, and there is the dependence. But to be on the safe side, if you go to 100 gigahertz, yeah, yeah. everything is fine. Yeah. I mean, what matters much more, if you looked very carefully to my view graphs, you might have seen two different numbers. Initially, I said lifetime is 700 nanoseconds, 
you saw another view graph with only set 400 nanoseconds. From sample to sample, you have e easily a variation by a factor of two in the, in the intrinsic damping. So it just depends on, on the purity, the number of defects, and so on. Film thickness. Film thickness, too. Yeah. Okay, so I think uh, time's up, right? Thank you very much. <laughs>